Tonight on the Computer History Museum presents Revolutionaries. I had been making games for 20 years before I thought I had anything that the rest of the industry would be interested in hearing. Mark Cerny is a revolutionary in video game design. In his 30-year career, he's built games for every platform, and his work includes the legendary Sonic the Hedgehog. Here he talks about gaming and the future with Rich Hilleman of Electronic Arts. Major funding for revolutionaries is provided by the Intel Corporation. Usually what happens in the game business is you talk about what people have worked on. So I have a small list on here, and it's by no means final, but it's a nice start. So here's a small list of his credits. Um, Marble Madness, California Games, Ratchet and Clank, Jack and Daxter, Major Havoc, one I didn't know before today, Spyro, Crash, Total Eclipse, Sonic 2, and many other games like Uncharted that he's contributed since then. In addition to the obvious things that Mark does today for Sony, he's been an engineer, an artist, a theoretician, a hardware architect and designer, a manager, a game designer, an executive, and most recently, to his surprise, a writer. Um, he has won multiple industry awards, including the IDGA Lifetime Achievement Award and the Academy of Interactive Arts and Sciences Award. So that's how Mark comes to our space. Um, I've had the pleasure of working with Mark for off and on for roughly 20 years on various things, sometimes on the same side of the ledger, sometimes helping each other in surreptitious ways, but uh, we enjoy ourselves a great deal. So uh, what do you do for Sony, Mark? Oh, what do I do for Sony? Uh, it's, it's hard even to explain to my father at times. Um, <laughs> I, Sony has a lot of little groups that do technology in various places, and so I do what I call international global, what is it? Global technology coordination, which is a fancy way of making sure that the left hand talks to the right hand. And why that needs a trained professional, I have no idea. <laughs> um, but also, uh, at this time, I've, I've got a game project I'm working on, which is not announced yet. And very, it's, it's really not, unfortunately, it's not like film. In film, everybody knows what you're doing, and they know what stars are going to be in it, and uh, they know when it's going to release. Uh, they know the title. And in games, you know, until the moment when you walk out on stage and announce what you're doing to 5,000 people, that thing is top secret. We, we even make stuff up that isn't true about it sometimes. If we're smart. <laughs> I think one of the things that makes me excited about this is it's been a few years since Mark actually got to be as actively involved in directing a game to, to be finished. And so I'm looking forward to the results because it's, uh, I learn something every single time. Um, so in your current job, you do a number of different things. What do you think an ideal day would look like? Uh, I don't know. I mean, for me, the, the, the interesting thing is about not going in to do the same thing every day or not working even with the same set of people every day. I mean, it's inevitable that whatever group you're working with, uh, you, you know, you get a little tired of that. And so if you're working on a couple projects at once, um, then you know, maybe you're tired of programming for Project X that week, and then you can do, do, go do a bit of game design for Project Y. For, for most of the last 20 years, um, I mean, typically I've been working on anything from two to four games at once. And, in roles that are somewhere two down or ten down in the hierarchy. Um, right now, it's amazing to be uh, so heavily involved in a game yeah, that's, that I haven't done in, in 20 years. Wow, I didn't think it had been quite that long. One of, one of the things that I have always been impressed by you is your ability to maintain your grasp of the absolute cutting edge of hardware technology in a business that increasingly doesn't spend a lot of time paying attention to that. How do you keep up on that so much? I don't know. I mean, the bits and bytes are pretty easy in the end. I mean, I don't really. The, the trickier part of the equation is the human equation. I mean, ultimately, there's going to be uh, the, the human factor. Ultimately, there's going to be a player. They're going to play that game. What are their expectations? And that changes uh, every couple of years. There's some kind of um, revolution in people's expectations about what a, playing a game is going to bring to them. So right now, we're in the middle of the tablet gaming revolution. And are we still doing the phone game revolution, or is that over? We had the Facebook revolution. That depends on how big the phone is. And you know, compared to that, the hardware just doesn't change that much. We, we have a business that um, attracts a, a high degree of people who have unique and, and 
a unique combination of skills. And sometimes it's, we come to our business because we're looking for things, and sometimes we come to our business because we're running away from things. What are the things that make Mark Cerny afraid? I mean, for me, um, I find the actual process of doing low-level game design unbelievably stressful because you're creating a scenario in your head for the, the hour of the game, and you're, you're trying, there's so many things you have to think about. You, you have a, a level in this game, you have an objective, so you want to be sure that you can see the objective from the start of the level. You want to be sure that as you move through the terrain, you don't get especially lost, but there's still an aspect of exploration to it. You want to make sure that it never gets monotonous. You want to make sure, by having various styles of design within it, you want to make sure that nothing repeats too much because people will think they've gone back. You want to mix up the scenarios that they face in terms of the combat or whatever mechanic that you're facing. You want it to be artistic on some level. You're flat out guaranteed that all of those objectives cannot be achieved at once. And so the process of creating a design is staring at a piece of paper in the old days, in the new days it's working in Illustrator and staring at your screen, getting very little done. Um, it, it frankly is not very much fun to do, but the fun is, that's just the start of it. The fun is when it's all built six months later and you go, go back and do it, it usually turns out okay. But there, there, is, you, a lot, you, there is a lot of uh, fear and unknowns in that process. Uh, it, it, one of the things that I've always thought was remarkable about your products is that you are clearly having almost a conversation with your customers, with, the, with your players, about what you're trying to teach them about when you're going to figure out how to use what you've taught them to matter to them deeply in the game and how that yields some, some deeper meaning to that user. And that seems to be a big part of the process for you. Yeah, I mean, it, to the degree you can make it intentional, it's great. I remember, uh, I think it was Gwyn uh, Gwyneth Paltrow once in an interview saying that, yes, she'd chosen this particular moment in the movie as to be the moment when she was going to smile for the first time and to intellectualize it to that degree. I guess you have to because that movie is filmed out of order, right? Yeah, so if you haven't planned it all out in advance, it won't be happening on the screen. Um, but yeah, we have our own version of that. I mean, everything that the player is going to do in the game needs to be introduced and in fact reintroduced. Yep. If we're clever about it, we're even watching the player's behavior, figuring out what they understand and don't understand and then re-cueing them as nicely as possible. We don't want to say, oh, you're, you know, you're bad. We just want to say, by the way, have you forgotten? Uh, hold this button to do this kind of action. And players aren't all the same. One of the advantages that Hollywood have, has is they really kind of have your attention and you don't, they don't give you any buttons in the theater to deviate from any of the controls. So we have to anticipate all that change. So I, I have seen you over the years grow in a lot of ways and, and uh, I've watched you actually vanquish some of those fears. So Mark is one of the more uh, innovative people in our space and thinking theoretically about how our business should work. And, and several years ago, we're going to talk about it a little later, he helped create something called the Cerny Method which is a guidepost for many of the designers in this business about the questions they need to ask about their games. But the process of telling the rest of the world about that at the time was hard for Mark. That, that, was, that was difficult, yeah. That was my first, uh, first time to speak in public. And uh, you know, I've heard about, um, is it a hot sweat or a cold sweat where you wake up in the middle of the night where you, you're burning, you think you're going to die? <laughs> um, <laughs> And a couple nights before the speech, I, I actually did do that. Um, I mean, it was the point where I had to write down every word that I was going to say or I wasn't confident that I could be at all coherent on stage. One thing I did learn is there's, there's slow time and there's fast time. And slow time is everything that happens up until the point when you get up on stage. And then it's fast time. It's a white blur. You <laughs> speak, and then an hour later, it's over. And it doesn't feel like an hour, does yeah, it? Yeah, it doesn't, no. <laughs> well, I, I watched Mark, who basically op operated on basically pure terror for about an hour and a half or so during that one, including questions that he soldiered through. The questions were the most amazing part. Oh, it gets easier. I mean, the main reason I didn't start speaking until then was I didn't particularly have anything to say. I, I had been making games for 20 years before I thought I had anything that the rest of the industry would be interested in hearing. I talked a little bit about the Cerny Method before. Why don't you tell us a little bit more about what the Cerny Method was and, and what does it mean today? 
Um, so I don't, I don't call it the Cerny method. I just call it method. Yeah. <laughs> you, you can call it. The rest of us you call, can call it the Cerny, Cerny method. method. Um, so in, in 1994, I had an amazing opportunity. And I, I think, I don't know, uh, maybe less than 100 people in the games industry have ever had this. I, I moved to Hollywood to work at Universal Studios in the middle of the, the multimedia boom. Whatever that was, I don't know. But they wanted to make multimedia. And they handed me a giant bag of, of money. And I had no supervision whatsoever. <laughs> and, and he hated it, can you tell me? Uh, tough times. <laughs> and you know, I thought, OK, so now um, nobody's watching. Nobody's telling me what to do. How is it that I feel games should be made? Um, and uh, two, three years later, when I'd made games in that fashion, and they'd done rather well, that was Crash Bandicoot and Spire of the Dragon, I put it up, made a list with Michael John, yep. um, the co-creator of Method, and uh, gave a talk about it at DICE in 2002. So really, a couple points in that. One was. We had drifted far from our arcade roots. So it was pretty easy in 1972 to tell if your game was a good game or not. If your game was a good game, you'd earn lots of quarters. If your game was a bad game, you wouldn't get any. And so uh, what was Nolan Bushnell's first take on games? Computer, computer space. Yep, computer it was space. easy to tell that computer yep. space was not as good a game as Pong because computer space um, didn't get very many quarters and Pong got so many that the first prototype busted as a result, right? <laughs> so this was a, a simple market because there was no marketing. There was no real sales. You would put your game in the arcade and the consumer would speak directly to you by spending money or not spending money. It's pretty brutal because they could, uh, they could see it for free, they could play it for a quarter, and if it wasn't fun, they wouldn't ever play it again. Very, very pure market. I think there's never been another aspect of gaming that's quite been like that. The I mean, even, yeah, I mean, even iPhone, where the games are as cheap as they were in the arcades, the fact is there's 100,000 of them and they do do marketing for them. The issue with consumer games with by the mid-90s is we no longer saw who was playing our games. So we would hand it off to the marketing and sales department who would do the TV ads and make the box and sell that game for 50 bucks. And by the time it was in somebody's hands, it really didn't matter much. The quality of the game, that person owned it. I mean, that was the, right. the thinking. And there were some real abuses of this, such as um, a friend of mine worked on a $50 game that only half of it could be finished. There was a fatal bug in the middle, and they didn't bother finishing it because they didn't figure there would be much in the way of implications for that. <laughs> On our side in product development, um, there's this thing where you know, you're a bunch of guys in the office making games. Who do you make the games for? You make them for each other. Uh, it had gotten to the point where the games were too hard even for us. <laughs> So one aspect of what we did was we did consumer testing. I know this doesn't sound very advanced, but wow, you try having that conversation in 1995. Mm -hmm. We had something called a focus test. So a focus test would be set up by the marketing department. They'd show you the game. They'd give you the game name. They'd have people play it for 90 minutes. If they'd, you're lucky, they had played it for 90 minutes. If you're unlucky, 10 minutes. Yeah. They'd have a moderated discussion. Uh, we put all that aside, and we just sat people down, and we had them play for uh, from the start of the game to the end of the game, and we'd watch, and we'd see where they had problems with the game. Uh, and oh, is that an ego-destroying experience? I mean, we do that. <laughs> you work on it for a year, you put it in front of people, and then like as not, you are out doing some pretty heavy drinking that evening. <laughs> uh, so that was a phenomenal success. The first Crash Bandicoot was actually not done that way. And um, we were lucky enough, our producer in Japan, uh, a Mr. Shuhei Yoshi Yoshida, who now runs all of product development for Sony PlayStation. And a very nice man. Um, he ran it by his monitor group in Japan, who reported some amazing things, as in, our game isn't playable. So from the next project, we set up this room. We did the testing. Um, 
If you go to a publisher today, like as not, you will find an exact duplicate of that room. Yep. And only about half of the companies know that that started in Foster City with, uh, what was it? It was Crash Bandicoot 2 in 1997. And it's all the way down to people sit, you gotta sit people down, but they will watch each other play the games. And so you have to put up little barriers between them. You will see those little barriers in at pretty much every publisher in the world. I mean, it's a different world in that we were recording this stuff on videotape so we could look at it later and today it's digital. Yeah, I, th I mean, the other thing you did was that I remember at the time was you had your grid paper maps. So he would have a map of what a game level would look like. And when there are lots of little X's in one spot, that was not a happy mark. A lot, a lot of people dying, and if you needed to make it easier because the players weren't uh, getting past that, you would. But player confusion is much more of an issue than player death. And something like Jack and Daxter, if you didn't know what you were supposed to do next, you could wander around the virtual world for two hours, literally in one of these tests. And at some point, we'd figure that, hey, maybe we should put more hints in the game, and then we'd politely tap you on the shoulder and suggest and, and point you to where you really should go. So that was one of the aspects of method, was getting back in touch with the consumer. Um, another aspect of method was getting away from thinking of a game as something that you could write as a document. So I don't, and you know, EA was probably the worst offender. Sorry. EA, we, they had this thing called a GDD, right? A game design document, probably still do. And everybody wanted to copy EA's production, production methodologies because you know, EA was doing so well, um, sales-wise. Because we, we could spend more money than anybody else doing it. Probably. So the idea was that you would put a guy in a room and they would write about a 500-page document describing what the game would be if they were going to make the game, down to, Every last detail, what the enemies look like, how many times you could hit them before they fell down. Then the idea would be that this document would be handed off to the producers and the programmers and they would make a schedule down to days as to how that game would get developed. Anything more involved here? We would, we would believe that we could assess what every technical risk was going to be in advance oh, and right. mitigate them. Right. <laughs> Which, which worked perfectly. We never had a bug the entire time. <laughs> well, and what, you, what you find out when you make a game is that you get about a week in and that wasn't fun and you do something totally different. Yeah, and it was, so only the, it was only the second word in the first paragraph of the first thing. So it turns out it isn't fun to make a game about whales. So yeah. another aspect of method was that a game design was five pages and one picture to show what it is that you wanted to make. And you needed to green light the game or not on that basis. And as far as that schedule went, you were winging it anyway, right? <laughs> Stop lying to yourself. Dan. So, I mean, in modern terms, you probably would want to work up 50 pages. But in modern terms, we have 100 people on these projects. It's not much of a, a sacrifice. Yeah. Uh, another aspect of this, and I guess the final big aspect of method was pre-production. So my, my belief is we, we go and we start making these games and it's a struggle. Some of them are fun fast and some of them aren't fun for, and, and you work at it and sometimes they get more fun and sometimes they don't. And there is this kind of toxic environment in some companies where as you're struggling to make your game fun that somehow you failed, uh, right? And you should get rid of those guys and get more talented people to make your games. Well. The third and final part of method was that really it's okay to kill the games. You know, not every game deserves to get made. Uh, and a different way of looking at this is if your company is operating properly, you will be killing something like, just to throw out a random number, about 30% of the games should die early in development. And by doing that, you're saving a tremendous amount of money and a tremendous amount of heartache. And if, if you have the reverse philosophy that you've got to do all of them to the end, well, they won't turn out very well and I, probably people won't enjoy making them. Yeah, I mean, the dirty little secret is that you don't usually do anybody any favor by helping them finish a game that fails. It just is a waste of their time. It's a waste of the opportunity cost. So in modern terms, what would you do? You'd be making a $30 million title, which believe it or not, is on the cheap end for what we do these days. And yep. you'd spend about $10 million, and you'd get everybody in a room, and you'd say, okay, do we want to spend the next 20 or not? 
Uh, and you know, my feeling is 30%, even half, kill them at that point. Now, from an accounting perspective, you just threw out $10 million, right? So it's a very hard philosophy to get people to um, but you saved 20. accept. But you saved 20, exactly. Right. Yeah, I, I think it's, the challenge there is that that feels very scary to people who are in charge of money. Um, just, just for some context, we've made some progress. So what was that ratio like in coin -op? It wasn't 30%, it was. Oh, coin -op. Kind of well, ratio. Atari was different than most coin -op. Yeah, so the answer there was like 80 or 90, right? It's two thirds. Yeah, so 60% of all games that but were But that wasn't, though, that worked very differently, though. But that was the games that were taken to test. That was games that were 80% finished. So yeah. uh, Atari, uh, and uh, this is not the Pong era. This is like uh, early 1980s. Gauntlet era. Yeah, Gauntlet era. Um, it was a pretty interesting place. Uh, yeah. we, we were told as, as game creators that uh, what we had to do had to be absolutely unique because that is what management believed would sell. So if anybody had ever made a two-person fighting game, that we were basically banned from making a two-person fighting game because that would be insufficiently creative. Each game had to be a unique genre that nobody ever had seen before. Uh, fun. You did, you did well in that. I, okay. Yeah. Um, <laughs> One failure, one did okay, that was major, ma major havoc, and then yep. one that did well, that was Marble Madness. Uh, now, we, we'd go ahead and we'd have these ideas, so it would be a brand new concept that any, nobody had seen before, brand new hardware every time. Uh, we would also have, uh, ideally, a brand new controller. We'd make these games up until about the 80% point, so when they looked like they were actually finished, but maybe the final parts of the game weren't there, we put it in an arcade, see if it earned enough money to sell, and at that point we would kill two out of three. And that's brutal, that's about eight months of your life. So what was funny was Electronic Arts used to be in just outside of Foster City, and across the street at the Fashion Island Mall was an arcade that was right next to the movie theater there. Yes. And our friends at Atari would always trot their new machines in there, so we'd run over at lunch and watch them. It was great, it was awesome. And we'd usually see somebody like Mark sitting in the back with a big frown on their face the entire time. Well, the, the economics were very difficult. So those machines were roughly $2,500 and they were being paid for by the quarter. The, the, the manufacturer didn't own those machines, that was the operator, like the, the yep. mall yep. owner. So that's 10,000 plays just to break even, except that that operator had uh, rent, salaries, electricity, a lot of repair, like $25 a month to keep those joysticks yeah. working. Uh, so it turned out you needed 20 or 30,000 plays on a machine to get it profitable. Uh, and it would be pretty easy to tell if you just put the machine, you put the machine in the mall, if that machine wasn't instantly the highest earning machine there, it was going to be unsaleable. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Mark talked a little bit about the fact that he spent a little time in Hollywood. Uh, that was an interesting time for the whole of the business. I spent a little time trying to do business with Hollywood. My big, my big excitement was I settled a strike once. That's my high point. Um, but Mark actually spent more time there probably than anybody I can think of. And a part of what made that interesting was the people he worked with and the time that he worked there. So he already talked a little bit about how Universal gave him a pile of money. What he didn't tell you is why. Um, he worked with some pretty interesting people at that time, including a guy named Skip Paul that I think was real important to you. Yeah, so um, when I joined Universal, it was 1994, uh, it was still uh, Lou Wasserman and Sid Sheinberg who had been running the company for, I think, 40 years. Uh, Music Corporation of America, right? They were agents to start all of that before it evolved into the modern Universal studio. Uh, and uh, I was recruited to um, work out uh, the strategy that Universal should take in the brand new world of multimedia. I think multimedia, what, it was missed, and seventh guess. Yeah, exactly right. And then people thought that, okay, there's this thing and it's not a video game and we need to investigate. It's a brand new category of entertainment. Uh, and so one of the top couple or five executives at Universal, uh, a man named uh, Skip Paul, recruited me into to work on that. Uh, you know, I was at that point playing with Skip's slush fund, um, which was great because that was more than enough to fund video games. It was, uh, you know, make a game in those days. If you were spending $2 million, you were so radically outspending your competition. <laughs> it was fantastic. Um, and for Lou, that was just, uh, or for uh, 
for Skip, that was just a script cost. Well, <laughs> Skip used to warn me. He'd say, Mark, right now, you know, you guys aren't actually making any money, therefore you have complete free freedom. As soon as you start making money, then everybody's going to be interested in your part of the business. Um, so we managed to make, it was amazing, with about 10 staff. We decided to just make conventional video games with high budgets. We leveraged the heck out of the Universal Studios connection. So we had movie production designers. Um, I worked with Catherine Hardwick, who of course is now a quite famous movie director, but in those days she was my production designer on a game. Uh, they just opened it all up, animators, character designers, uh, musicians. And so we used all those connections and used the budgets which were high for the industry and but um, uh, small for Universal, put it all together and we must have made them $200 million in profit from just a couple years of work out of a group of 10 and initial seed money of less than $10 million. Yeah, amazing. Yeah, and never to be repeated, I think. You can't, you can't even make one game for that much money. So that, that's the era of, uh, of Crash and Spyro. Yes, that was, that was Crash Bandicoot and Spyro the Dragon, yeah. yes. So tell us about the teams that started those and some of those people and where they are now. So um, we had a small office on the lot and uh, we had a marketing guy, and we had a product development guy, that was me, and we had a legal guy, that was my partner, had our, our uh, funding, and basically went out to the industry to see who would be, interest, who would be up for, um, well, uh, working with us. Uh, so, I mean, it's a fairly simple process. There are a number of independent developers and there's games that they want to make and there's games that we want to make. And so signing a developer is really a process of negotiating to see maybe you want the thing that they're making or you maybe have a concept that you want to bring to them. So we ended up um, picking up four very, very small companies. Uh, Naughty Dog, which was three people. Uh, Insomniac, which was two people, and two more companies, which are actually slightly larger. I think they were maybe five and seven people, respectively. Massive. Uh, Massive. And we, we worked with those people. We hooked up the money pipe, and we hooked up. We had a couple of producers on the staff ourselves with a lot of experience, and we'd work with these young guys, and we, we grew the teams. The, the, the teams that succeeded were Insomniac and Naughty Dog, and in both cases, they had uh, management that was incredibly driven. I mean, Ted Price at Insomniac, that was a guy who, if he had to sleep under his desk for five years to make it happen, he was going to sleep under his desk. And I, I think you add it all up to this point, maybe... Maybe he has. Well, maybe he has, <laughs> yeah. But these companies today, there are maybe two, three hundred people, and uh, subsequent to graduating from Universal, uh, they've both made, I don't know, 15 or 20 games. I mean, in aggregate, each of those companies has probably made about a billion dollars of video games at this point. Right. Now, why did you leave Universal? What caused that to happen? Well, I percent? left Universal because um, we were middlemen. Uh, we elected not to s do the marketing and sales for the titles that Insomniac and Naughty Dog created. We contracted with them to create the games, and then we contracted with Sony Computer Entertainment to do the marketing and sales. And we had three product deals with Naughty Dog and Insomniac. And after the three products were finished, in both cases, Sony convinced them to sign with them directly and cut out Universal Interactive Studios, which was the division by at that point I was the president of. So I had kind of a tough choice. I could rebuild, which means go back and try to find developers who were two, three people and, and, and grow them. And you know, I figured that the, the most fun you ever get is working with talented people. And it doesn't really matter what your role is. And so I gave up being you know, president of a division at Universal at age 34 um, to uh, just so I could go be a consultant with Insomniac and Naughty Dog because I figured that at the end of the day that would be a lot more fun. And was it? It was a lot more fun, though I, I do, do have to say once those games hit about 100 people a project, it gets very hard to chip in from the side and add that little piece. So working on two or four games with a variety of companies, that's easier when the teams, um, yeah, maybe 10 people. Uh, and it, at this point, there's really not a whole lot uh, I can even contribute. I mean, Insomniac and Naughty Dog are pretty much the top of the industry. You worked on a lot of kind of famous products in the business. A couple of them were a surprise. Um, why don't you tell us a little bit more about Sonic? That was the other great 
uh, Sonic the Hedgehog action product in the business besides Mario. So uh, it's, it's been 20 years. Yeah. I'm hoping there's a statute of limitations here. <laughs> <laughs> so um, Sonic the Hedgehog came out when I was working for Sega, which is a Japanese company. And uh, Sega had been um, struggling. They've been trying to make not just the, uh, the games, but also the consoles that the games had been played on. They had a 4-bit system, which was sold only in Japan, which did um, OK. Then they had an 8-bit system, the uh, Sega Master System, and that had a 4% market share uh, in the United States. And Nintendo had 94. And Atari, which was continuing its downward decline, had the remaining two. I mean, 4% of consoles, that's just mom going into the store and buying the wrong console because <laughs> <laughs> they, all, they all look alike to her, right? Maybe, maybe she didn't even know there was more than one. Uh, so Sega came up with their next console. This was the Genesis. It's a 16-bit console. And they had the idea that they put just an, uh, an unheralded amount of money into a game. They would have three people and work for 10 months on this thing. Shop. 30 man months. Well, Sega in, in Japan in particular was quite the sweatshop. I, mean, I worked there for a couple of years. Is, is one programmer, one artist, three months, that's a game. Uh, and at, at the point at which I joined the Tokyo uh, group, they'd made 40 games of which two could be played and enjoyed. Yikes. Yeah. So anyway, this idea, uh, take a step back, put what is that? That's five times as much uh, investment into a single title. And that title was Sonic, Sonic the Hedgehog. Uh, and they were really interested in Disney characters and Disney very fluid animation. And one of the things they did uh, was they, they drew up a couple characters, uh, including the one that became Sonic. He was modified a little bit afterwards. His arms were short, shortened and uh, his color was changed slightly. But they, they handed over three characters. Sonic, something that looked like Bart Simpson, uh, a couple more. And on one, one of my trips shuttling back and forth between the States and Japan, they handed it to me and said, you know, Mark, uh, you're an American. What do, you, what do you think? And I thought, wow, you know, that's just anecdotal. Um, it's not as if my opinion really matters here if I say it's great. You know, we need to ask the clever brains in marketing at <laughs> Sega of America what they think. Oh, no. So I take these and I make color copies of them from in the Tokyo office. Color copies being a rather hard thing to do in Five Tokyo days, yeah. in 1988, 1989. And, uh, I take them back to the States and I present the copies and, you know, here's our number one team from Tokyo and the concept they're working on and we could really use your feedback. No response. Uh, three months later, I ask and they say, well, you know, that, those characters, they're so bad, they're unsalvageable. So no response back to the team, but the idea was that they were going to make a list of the 10 things you needed to do if you were going to create a character that would be successful in the States. Uh, and then they wanted to work with, um, they were talking about quality characters like Will Vinton, like, um, sure. which are interesting things. Yep. Definitely Americana, though. Yep. Um, and how, you know, that's what you want to do if it's going to be successful. Of course, Sonic came out, Sega's largest success ever, uh, to the point where it came out and then they dropped the price of the hardware a little bit and then within the space of six weeks their console was selling five times as much. That's how big the impact of that game was with its unsalvageable character. <laughs> Though, to be fair to them, you know, I, it's a video game. A character is good, but what the character does, that's much more important. If your character is six out of ten, if your gameplay is great, you'll still be there. Mario, in the original, Donkey Kong, right. it is okay. Uh, Crash Bandicoot, probably okay. What is that? Is that a, I was asked on my Tokyo interviews, right. is that a ghost? <laughs> is that a dog? Yeah, I don't know. I think it's no, a dog. it's Crash Bandicoot. Bandicoot. Yeah. It's a hint. <laughs> <laughs> Go look it up. It's a real animal. Yeah. Well, it doesn't look like the animal is part of it. Uh, w another thing that happened there is this, this, uh, this team, this three people, 10 months, is it took them 14 months. 
and they had to add one full-time person and one part-time person to finish it. So by the time it was done, 4.5 people, 14 months, essentially twice the budget that they'd been allocated, uh, the project leader got cussed out by the company president and quit basically as soon as that game shipped. So that is the end of Sonic in Japan. Well, so what, what those who don't get, one of the things that I thought was so valuable about Sonic for Sega at the time was Sega was trying to make the case they had a higher performance gaming system. Blast processing. Than the yeah. Nintendo Entertainment System. And Sonic was all about speed. And so it meant that the personification character of that platform really tried to carry the marketing position for it. I'm, I'm sure it was not designed in, but it sure worked well. No, it was absolutely designed in. It was by design. It was attempting to show how fast the console yeah. could be. Let's talk about Atari. So when did you go to work for Atari? How old were you? 17. Yeah. So, and, and what did you do before you were at Atari? So I um, started, I went, got to high school when I was 12. I started auditing classes at UC Berkeley when I was 13. Uh, I graduated from high school at 15. Uh, I, when, by the time I got to UC Berkeley, I'd done, I was into the third year math and physics. But I have to say, I don't know, uh, it just wasn't all that interesting at the end of the day. It was just a bit of a tragedy. I was a good student, right. but uh, I just wasn't finding all that much joy in it. And at the same time, I had two hobbies, which were programming and playing video games. And I got a chance to uh, combine both into a job and jump for it. So I started at Atari uh, January 18, 1982. Wow. Just uh, almost exactly 30 years? Oh, almost yeah, we're, 31 years. We're over, yeah, we're over 30 years now. So when you first went there, who was there and what was it like? Well, uh, Nolan Bushnell was gone by then. Um, he'd left a few years before, but uh, Ed Logg and Dave Toyer, um, a couple other of the game greats were there. I just missed Ed Rotberg, who'd left the right. year before. But these were the guys who made, if any of you were in an arcade 30 years ago, they made Asteroids, Centipede, um, Battle Zone, Missile Command, Tempest, and the, the truly great Masterworks of yeah. that era. Yeah. yeah. That, and that was it. So your Time Warner had just kind of bought those guys, so they, they had kind of fat paychecks, although. They did not have fat paychecks. Oh, well, that's a shame then. Yeah, it, it was a shame. Uh, it was bought, I swear the company was bought in 1977. And that money didn't go to the creators. Hmm. So what happened there was that the Atari VCS, the consumer uh, console, um, also part of Atari, right. um, was doing amazingly well. And independent developers were being started up. You, you, know, you could just go and set up your own shop to make these games. And so Atari thought that they needed to pay their programmers a lot more money uh, to, to retain them. And so you could get, simply based on the manufactured numbers of cartridges, a bonus of oh, wow. 15 cents. That was the bonus to retain people, which meant that um, Pac-Man, the company, the game that almost put the company down, seven million cartridges, 15 cents. The day that shipped, they wrote out a check to Todd Fry. Yeah, for a million bucks. Uh, for $1.05 million, put that in today's dollars, it's about 2.5 million, and then Todd failed to file an income tax return. <laughs> it's one of the and great Todd, stories of the era. It is, and, and Todd built that, that was only about Eight weeks, 12 weeks work, something like I that? I think, yeah, I thought it was about three months. Yeah and, yeah, and he knew what the right answer was, by the way, which often we don't know what the right answer was. So anyway, um, in CoinOp, which was a totally separate division of Atari, they saw that, and there was this brief period between when sales were still high and before the market crashed, right. when they bumped up the bonuses where you could get, um, oh, it was something like $20 for every game that was sold. It was really good money. Right, yeah. yeah. Well, you guys, so I worked in the other side of the fence. We paid a lot of attention because Atari had an interesting compensation system. So there were bonuses on those particular games, but how were those bonuses allocated? Oh, over a number of years. So uh, I quit. What, what I remember was the team share. Stuff. Oh, right. It was a team sharing thing. So you'd split it, up, split it up between the hardware engineers and the software engineers, and there'd be some project management that, that could get some money. So if you had a huge role on the project, you'd end up with something like 25% right. of it. But 25% of... Um, of that $20, 20 per year. is that's five dollars, and uh, those games were, you know, in the heyday, that was fifty thousand units. That was real money, but there was only, as I said, one year, and the only game which came out in that one year was Millipede, that sold anything. Uh, but that that sold ten million units. Yeah. Sorry, ten 
thousand units. That was good for Ed. That was Ed's game, right? Yeah, that was Ed's, Ed's game. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, so, what caused you to leave Atari? Oh, I don't know. I made a game and it had sold well and nothing had changed. And, you know, if I'd been older than, say, 20, um, <laughs> I think that wouldn't have bothered me, but I was 20 and I was expecting things to happen so fast in my life. Well, Marble Madness was really, in, in a world of quite different games at Atari, Marble Madness is quite different. Yeah, it was a, I'm, I'm very glad I did it. It was a nice thing to have done in my youth. Uh, so, and also I, I started thinking, wow, this is easy, right? Here it is, I was doing project management on this thing and I did design and I did pro pro programming and it's gonna be a huge success. Why don't I set up my own company and do this? And then. Uh, and then you did. And then I did. And I set up shoestring video, and that did not go so well. <laughs> uh, I went broke, and I joined Sega. There you go. Um, so you went, you uh, you had the benefit of pretty accelerated education. What was the training from all of that that you ended up finding was the most useful? Well, you know, quantum mechanics, not much call for that in the video games. But, you know, physics, uh, it, it does have its uses. And definitely having a solid mathematical background is very useful in games. Well, I. I so I'll, I'll give him one little hint here, what I think is important. One of the things that Mark made the transition from that very few people made, the 80s was about video games that in general were 2D video games. They were sprite-based objects on, on play fields that went off into the background. And about 1995 or so, that started to change. And so our business is predominantly now 3D oriented. The things that you see in movies and the things that we build are often the same kinds of things. The vast majority of programmers in our business did not survive that transition, and Mark was one of those who did. I suspect Berkeley, among other places, had something to do with it. Well, that. actually, I got in a very early start on all of that. Is um, I loved the video games, and um, I was doing a little hobbyist programming in high school, and uh, I was also playing Dungeons and Dragons with my brother and his friends. Not AD and D, the original. I mean, we're talking 1976 here, and. Uh, I was thinking, wow, all this rolling of dice and maps, and wouldn't this be easier with computers? So uh, I sat down with my brother, and we had this idea that we would borrow a little equipment from the university <laughs> and create a real-time 3D dungeon-crawling, story-driven, 20-hour RPG with you know combat sequences rendered from above with for speed and then for... Um, when you're walking around the dungeon, we'd have to do it on a scope. I mean, this is ancient days, right. but we could do that hidden line if we wrote our programs right and give solidity to the objects, even though they were just done with green lines. Uh, and we were trying to do this with punch cards. Um, <laughs> on a? Well, originally a CDC 6400. Yes. <laughs> Big uh, iron. And it was a little ambitious. I mean, on the plus side, I derived, I didn't read it in a book, I derived the mathematics for 3D projections and how you could have a simulated world and get that on a screen properly, uh, using trig when I was 12. Uh, the, uh, tw 12, 12, 12. <laughs> the, uh, we did, my brother and I, uh, we gave up after a while, but, um, <laughs> we did finally see the game that we were trying to make. It released 20, oh, how many years? 17 years later. It was uh, called Final Fantasy VII. Oh, there you go. <laughs> and all it needed was a highly trained team of 30 professionals in about five years. 30? It was only 30? Well, maybe more. Maybe I don't know. Maybe more, I think, on that one. You know, how do you think you've helped change the console business? Um, I think, uh, yeah, realistically, I, I was one of a bunch of guys in the mid-90s that were trying to get, get us back on course when we'd strayed too far. We'd forgotten who was actually buying our games, and we'd forgotten how to make a game. Yeah. Uh, as far as the design side goes, you know, they've been really fun games, but it's Jerry Bruckheimer stuff. And it's just what I like to make. And, you know, it's not going to change the world. Uh, but people play it. But a people lot. play it and people enjoy it. You know, and that's that's enough that's for, for me doing. anyway. So one of the things that both of us have have been lucky to do is to be kind of grand generalist in a business, and and one of the things we've seen is teams go from three people who had to do everything under the sun, 
or one person maybe from time to time. Yes, I remember that era too. To teams that have 300 yeah. or more people on them. And one of the things that come out of that is specialization. That's been good news, but how's that been bad news? Well, first, the good news, right? So if you started out making games in 1982 or 1985, um, you were the programmer, the artist, the game designer. You did your own sounds, and you wrote your own music. And if you start out that way, you know, your later life, you're not going to end up in any one pigeonhole. That's it's right. great. And, and you know, you've, been, you've been the producer, too, right? Yep. And, uh, sure. and I'm a writer these days. I mean, once you, once you get going on that, yeah, you can't, you can't stop. You end up writing music for things you shouldn't write music for. What I, what I fear is that the trend, though, is you'll, you'll think in advance about what you're going to do. Maybe you'll think, wow, um, I've got a mind for physics, and I'd like to make games. You study physics in school, and then you join a games company, and you're the physics programmer, which is not all that exciting 20 years in, except that then you'll be the guy that takes the physics middleware, right? Some software package, and you're just integrating it. And then maybe you aren't even doing that anymore because it's part of the SDK that comes from the publisher. Or built in the hardware maybe someday. Or I think less likely. Less likely. Less likely. Yeah, less likely. So you know, my advice for anybody who's going to school, um, do a lot of things. And uh, if you're in your first years at a company is uh, maybe it'll cause trouble when you do this, but really try to do a lot of different things. Uh, even, um, even if it ruffles some feathers, uh, the, the, you'll have a lot more fun 10 or 20 years in if you had that kind of variety in your early years. Why are games so fascinating, Mark? <laughs> I don't know. I mean, we've, it's not just video games, right? We've had games perhaps for as long as we've had music and speech and everything else. Um, I, don't know. I mean, I, I look at, it's not quite the answer to your question, but I mean, my belief is pretty much everybody likes games. And historically, we've had a problem with the arcade games, and we've had a problem with these console games, since they're just so hard. Is you might enjoy games, but you have to read a 90-page manual before you can start playing your game. Who wants to do that? So we've taken a world where 7, 8 billion people would pretty much all enjoy that sort of thing and made it almost impossible for them to get started with it. And we're, we're seeing evidence of this in that these, these iPhone games and these Android games, I mean, the market's exploded. We have 10 times more people playing games now that uh, it's obvious, right? You just buy it, boot it, play it, and no, you know, nobody has to tell you the rules. Yep, that's usually the answer. Often played in the bathroom, by the way, nowadays, apparently. <laughs> Uh, I am currently working at a program or at a systems company. If I join a game company, will I participate in things other than software development? I mean, how easy is the transition to a job where, where I mix the kind of visual kind of design with the software design? It really all depends on the company. So uh, some of the companies are unbelievably collaborative. Um, Naughty Dog, uh, I mean, at least on the last project I was on with them, which was Uncharted 1, uh, just had the attitude that it's everybody's game, and if you see something that needs to get fixed, go fix it, or if it's somebody else's job, go talk to them about it. And this, this was, believe it or not, was literally true. If it's a programmer, don't get carried away, mind you, but if you think the art in some level of the game's not up to snuff, you're encouraged to go have that conversation. And they're doing well. You'd think that would lead to warfare, right? Trench warfare in the cubicles. Uh, but they did very well with it. So a company like that, you'll do very well. Uh, many companies are not like that. Uh, the larger the project is, the tougher it is, because on, on some level there has to be structure. Yeah, usually what's true is the larger the company is, the more money is at play, the less yeah. tolerance I mean, I, I would change. say really the thing to do is uh, find somebody who's doing a two, three person um, phone or tablet game and join that, because when the project's just two, three people, it's bound to be collaborative on that level. How do you pick which games to design? Survey, poll? The difficulty is you can't really ask people what they want. Um, if you do that, well, we've both tried that, right? <laughs> we, so we, paid a we price both for that. did this thing in the 90s where we would, um, because marketing made us, <laughs> we would write down little descriptions of the game we wanted to make and we'd show it to 10 consumers who would be like 
living in San Francisco or something. It's not really right. America there. Uh, it'll tell me. I'm sorry, that came out totally no, wrong. They, live, they live in San they Mateo, they were nearby. That's right, or San Mateo, or they live in a large city. city yeah. Right, and uh, they're probably all working in high tech anyway. anyway yeah. And so you run your little concept by them, and you ask them, you know, would you buy this game? But the thing is, you haven't made the game. It's as silly as it's trying to give three sentences about a movie and ask if you should spend $150 million making that movie. I think you're the one that told me that very famously, when Will Wright was thinking about making SimCity, uh, there were five concepts that were tested, and the concept that tested worst was SimCity, Sim City. which he ended up doing because he wanted to. He blew off the results of that yeah, testing, yeah. and it is his number one success. Yep. Even for Will. Yep, even for Will. Yeah. Um, let's see here. So I have, we're, we're gonna, we cannot escape conversation about games without a conversation about copy protection. So you and I will have this because we have to. What are the thoughts on DRM, which is digital rights management? Uh, you know, I personally try not to think about it very much. Uh, music business seems to be doing okay, uh, but they've had a real restructuring. So they're a lot more focused on um, uh, what they can do with the artist uh, and the concerts and all that, the events where participation is, is involved, and actually selling that object or even selling the rights has diminished due right. to, um, well, very high rates of, policy, of, of piracy. Um, PlayStation 3, which is the bulk of what I've been doing these past few years, apart from one very bad month, uh, has been going pretty well. We are free to make a title, and then that title is sold to people who purchase it, and we don't need to think about it. Yep. I, I, the one thing I'll add to that is most of what we have seen is that DRM is increasingly not necessary. And the reason why is because the games want to know who you are because you have some relationship with other people. Right. And so a lot of the companies are now trying to foster long-term relationships with the people who play their games. You're doing that with FIFA, yep. right? You have tournaments yep. and things. Yep. And so if you want to be included in that set, you will need to have bought the product and joined the club. And maybe you could pirate it, but then you'd be losing out on that living world. That's right. So uh, where does Mark go from here? What's Mark's next job look like? Oh, that's going to be quick, because I have absolutely no idea. <laughs> All right. Well, I'd like to thank Carol and everybody else from the Computer History Museum for having us tonight. Um, I appreciate all your time. Thanks for your great questions. And hopefully we see you next time. Thank you. Mark Cerny has changed the face of video gaming around the world. In his 30-year career, he's built games for every platform, and his work includes the legendary Sonic the Hedgehog. There are hundreds of stories like this at the Computer History Museum. Please join us next time for another episode of Revolutionary.